Hello and welcome to another Magic the Gathering Draft video. It's Al here with you and this is how to draft MTG. Today we're going to be talking about drafting multicolor in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty which was my current go-to strategy for the format. I'm going to show you how I do that, the pick orders, the draft strategy, the deck building tips, all that good stuff. As always, please do click like and subscribe if you enjoy these videos. It does help the channel a huge amount. Leave a comment below if you have any questions. Without further ado, let's get into the guide. Here we go. Bit of a different format for you today. We're going to try a slideshow style, so let me know how you like it in the comments below. Uh, here we go. We're talking about drafting multicolor in Kamigawa and Neon Dynasty. There are two sort of macro strategies as I see it in this format. The first is plan A, as I'm calling it, which is multicolor value, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And then plan B is drafting a more focused, what you might call macro synergy archetype. We're talking red, black, or red, blue artifacts, blue, black ninjas things like that, decks that have an actual theme to them and require sort of a mass of cards that are all looking to do to do the same thing. These are harder to draft, and I don't believe they're quite as powerful in this format, at least not right now. So this is the plan B. We're going to be talking about plan A. Green, white enchantments is also kind of a macro synergy archetype, but it does fit a bit more into the plan A style of deck. So if you're liking that deck, stick with me. Uh, this fits into that quite well. So we're talking about multicolor value, the overall draft strategy. We're not really going to be thinking about color pairs. We're not going to be thinking about archetypes. We're just trying to draft as many high quality cards as we possibly can and then prioritize enough mana fixing so that we can actually play all of those cards that we've drafted. We want to play as many of them as we can. Um, it tends to be black or green based because most of the best cards exist in black and green so we're always sort of leaning towards black or green as a good starting point or in sort of like a tie break situation our game plan deck building we're trying to play for the long game we're trying to win the long game so we want to have a better end game than our opponent and that's going to be fairly easy to do uh, if we're always picking the best cards that we see in the draft uh, we want to have an early defense so that we don't get aggroed out, which can happen, but it doesn't happen all that often. And we want to prioritize onboard value as opposed to raw card draw spells. And you'll sort of see what I mean uh, as we go forward. But the best way to get onboard value is generally with sagas. The strengths of this archetype, it's not really an archetype, this strategy, we've got a lot of flexibility. We have a high power level because we're taking all the best cards and we don't require a particular color or archetype to be open at the table. We're just taking the good cards and taking the fixing and going from there, which means that reading signals in the draft is less important than it normally would be. So if you're not super confident at reading signals in the format or in general, um, this is a great place for you to be. And of course, we get to play as many of the best cards as we can that were available in the draft to us. Whereas if you're in a more focused macro archetype, you're, you're going to be passing some of the bombs that you get passed. Whereas here, we just get to take them. Weaknesses of the strategy, the mana base, obviously, uh, we, we need to prioritize fixing. And if we don't get it, we're going to be in a tight spot. We can be vulnerable to aggressive decks some of the time. So we want to make sure we have enough stuff to do early in the game that we don't get totally run over. And mulligans can be a little bit tough with this, this deck. So we want to make sure we're playing 17, 18 lands. And again, we have that fixing. And we're building our deck in such a way that we don't end up with um, some awkward opening hands. And we'll talk about how to do that a little bit later on. And finally, this does require strong deck building technique. I'm going to go over how to do that. But we do have to be pay paying attention to things like number of mana sources and curve and where our splash cards are on the curve and what... Uh, we're going to be trying to do uh, actually in game to, to make sure we're putting the best cards in the deck uh, for, for how it's going to go in the game. All right, let's get into the pick order, starting with the bombs, of course. Then we're getting into the best sagas, which is pretty much the best thing you can be doing in the format and in this deck. We want to just be playing as many excellent sagas as we can get our hands on. Then we're looking for good value creatures, the best value creatures, as I've outlined them here. 
uh, because those put presence onto the board but also generate card advantage and or board advantage for you. We're next uh, looking for synergy cards. These are cards that sort of ask a little bit more of you, but not too much of you, uh, such that you do need to build around them a little bit, but they are still quite powerful without too much of an investment in the draft portion. Then we're looking for removal. Removal is not at its best in this format, but I will outline what the best removal spells are and uh, why you should be taking them uh, over the other removal spells and sort of how they fit into this archetype. Then we're prioritizing fixing, and this is a, a little bit um, maybe controversial or, or looks a little bit weird. As of right now, the, the dual lands and the fixing cards are going kind of late. I can certainly see a world where we need to prioritize fixing a little bit more. Um, but as you'll see, these top five categories I've outlined here are all sort of pretty uh, small subsets of cards in the format. And you'll sort of be taking those in your first, you know, three, four picks, maybe five if you're lucky. And then right after that, as soon as there's no excellent cards in the pack, we're taking lands, we're taking fixing cards. And then finally, we're taking our filler and our role player cards, which I'm going to go over sort of where they fit and why you want to pick those up and when you want to pick those up. All right. Starting with the bombs, Jugan defends the temple. I'll quickly go over these uh, cards. This card's obviously super busted, uh, the highest winning uh, percent card in the set, Tuna Green, Saga makes a 1-1 one, one that makes a mana, then it puts two 1-1 one, one counters on your creatures, and then it comes back as a 2-2 two, two flying that buffs uh, creatures that you play afterwards. Excellent early, excellent late, card's really good. Fable of the Mirror Breaker, similarly one of the best cards in the set. Uh, while we don't really want to be playing red all that much in this archetype, this is an excellent reason to splash Red. Tuna Red makes a 2-2 two -two that makes treasures when it attacks, then it lets you rummage two cards, and then it creates essentially a Kiki-Jiki, uh, if you're a fan of the old sets, uh, which can make copies of your creatures. So you'll want to draft around this a little bit by grabbing more creatures that have Enter the Battlefield abilities, which you're already going to be doing anyway, so this card is super busted. Take it. Play it. It's great. Wandering Empire, two white-white. Three Loyalty Planeswalker with Flash, so you can flash it in on your opponent's turn, activate it right away. I uh, can tick up to give a plus one, plus one counter to a creature and give it first strike, which is excellent. If your opponent attacks into you, flash this in, buff one of your creatures, eat their creature, that's really good. Uh, and uh, it ticks down to make two twos, uh, and it ticks down for two to exile a tap creature and you gain two life. So a lot of utility here, and uh, then it just... Uh, so it's going to get you, like at least a card of value when it comes into play because you're going to hopefully be able to use it as a combat trick to eat your opponent's creature. And then from there, it just starts ticking up or, or doing whatever you need it to do. So a uh, card's super good. Inventive Iteration. This is an excellent reason to be splashing for blue or sort of playing a little bit of a heavier blue package in your multicolor deck. Um, four Mana Saga returns a creature uh, to hand, then lets you draw a card, and then it comes back as a 3-3 flying. Farewell. This is a card that I'm not super psyched about, but 17 lands has a, a huge win percentage on. Um, and it's a six mana uh, sorcery, lets you exile all artifacts or all creatures or all enchantments or all graveyards or any combination of those. So I think the, the, the important part here is that you can choose which of these modes benefits you the most. If you've got more creatures than your opponent, um, but your opponent's got some enchantment creatures and your creatures aren't enchantments, then if you say exile enchantments, you end up with a bunch of creatures left over or vice versa. Um, I know it doesn't really work vice versa, but uh, if your opponent's got a bunch of artifact creatures and you don't, then you exile art all artifacts and you still get to keep your creatures. So that's sort of how this card shakes out. Um, and it's got a high win percentage. I'm not a huge fan of Wraths, but I know a lot of people like this card, so uh, you can certainly play it in this archetype. The Invoke Cycle, except for the red Invoke, which is kind of unplayable. Uh, the green one is the best of these because you're more likely to be uh, uh, base green in this archetype. But uh, all of these are good, and uh, if you can get the, the a, good, a good amount of fixing, notably Grafted Growth, but also just like a bunch of dual lands or Network Terminal or, you know, good ways to actually get to four pips, it can happen. And I would actually recommend drafting these pretty highly uh, especially the green one, and trying to make these work. Uh, I think the white one is probably the worst of the four. Um, uh, the blue and the black ones are also excellent. You might take some of the top sagas over these, but uh, these can certainly work. 
Tatsunari Toad Rider, three mana three three makes three threes when you cast uh, makes another three three when you cast an enchantment. Uh, can't be blocked. It's uh, just a really good rate. Easy to cast. Easy to splash. Uh, all of the dragons are really good. They're double pipped, so we have to make sure that we have again grafted growth, which adds two mana of any one color if we want to be splashing these. Um, but they're all super excellent. And uh, I mean, even if we don't have get grafted growth, we can sort of make it happen by you know having enough dual lands and, and things like that, and getting to these in the late game. These are super super good. Blossom Prancer, best uncommon in the set right now in 17 lands. Um, we're likely to be main green anyways, and you know five mana four four reach draws you another creature or lets you gain four life uh, or puts a saga in your hand. Cards super busted. The reach is. A little over the top, in my opinion. It probably didn't need to have reach, but uh, it's uh, really, really good. So easy first pick, as is Kappa Tech Wrecker. Two mana, one, three, death touch. When it deals uh, combat damage to a player, you can have it lose death touch and exile an artifact or enchantment that player controls. If you can ever return this back to your hand with like another ninjutsu creature or something, uh, you can really go off with this thing. But as a baseline, it's really, really excellent. Uh, just a two mana one three death touch. It makes some of your green rem removal better, and uh, th always threatens to uh, kill one of uh, of your opponent's best things in combat. So this card is also one of the best uncommons in the set. The Kami War uh, costs one of each color of mana and an extra colorless mana to uh, exile a non-land permanent an opponent controls. Chapter two, you return up to one other target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. So you bounce something of your opponent's, then they discard a card, uh, and then it comes back as a 6-6 Flying Trample whenever it attacks. Uh, defending player chooses a non-land card in your graveyard, return that to your hand, and then this gets a power boost for the mana value of the card. So huge reward if you can get five colors going, and it's not that hard to do that in this format. So I would be happy to first pick this and uh, try to make it happen. Reckoner Bankbuster, complete opposite of Kami War. It's colorless, so this goes in any deck, but uh, it's quite good in a grindy value deck, which is what we're trying to do here. Two mana, four four vehicle, comes in with three charge counters, two and tap, to remove a counter, draw a card. When the last is removed, you get a one one pilot that helps to crew it. It's got a crew cost of three. Uh, pretty easy to return this to hand with ninjutsu some of the time, or if it goes to the graveyard, get it back with season of renewal, and. Uh, do it all over again. Huge card advantage and power and toughness uh, machine here. So great card. Life of Tashiro Umazawa, two mana black saga. First two chapters, plus two, plus two, minus one, minus one, or you gain two life. And then that uh, comes back as a two, three that taps for black mana for instants and sorceries. This is one of the best uncommons in the set and is totally a bond level card. So take it highly. Enjoy it. It's amazing. And it's easy to splash, and it's good in the late game, too, even though it's a two-drop. It's amazing on turn two, but it's also very good in the late game. Tameshi, Reality Architect, two and a blue, two, three. Whenever one or more non-creature permanents are returned to anyone's hand, draw a card. Only once each turn does that trigger. Usually it's going to be returning stuff to your hand. X and a white, return a land you control to its owner's hand. Return target artifact or enchantment card with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Sorcery speed, but still really busted. Uh, and you, of course, are drawing a card as well when you do this because of its first ability. Tameshi is a total game warping card. Easy to splash. Easy to splash its ability as well. Uh, so super high pick. Reality Chip, two mana, 04 artifact uh, with reconfigure for two and a blue. It lets you look at the top card of your library and if it's equipped to something, you can play lands and cast spells from your top of your library. If you've never played with this effect before, it's super powerful. Uh, as you, you can just sort of keep playing stuff off the top of your deck. Uh, and it's kind of, in a, in a weird way, like just infinite card draw. Uh, as long as you can just continue to play stuff. Obviously, once you've hit your land play, you have to stop. But um, yeah, card's really good. Takes over the game. And it also comes down early and blocks for you, which is not bad if you're, if you're main blue. Which, which we won't likely be in this archetype, but uh, this is easy to splash and takes over the game. Restoration of a Ganjo, two and a white saga, chapter one, get a planes, chapter two, you can discard a card to return target permanent card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tap, so that's nice later on in the game, and that comes back as a three, four vigilance whenever it attacks or blocks, you get a one, one, so this is just pure value, uh, just an excellent saga, 
easy first pick and uh, easy to splash if need be. Biting Paul Ninja, two and a black, three, three Ninja with Ninjutsu of two and a black. Comes in with a menace counter. Whenever it deals combat damage, you can remove that menace counter to uh, take a card out of your opponent's hand. So this is super good, obviously with Ninjutsu enablers, but just as a three mana, three, three menace, it's pretty hard to block as it is. When it connects, it's devastating for your opponent. If you ever get to reset it by bringing it back to your hand with a Ninjutsu ability, get to do it all over again or buy it back with Season of Renewal. Card's dope. Pick it highly. It's amazing. Kyodai, Soul of Kamigawa, three and a white, three, three, flash, flying. When it comes into play, another target permanent gains indestructible. And for as long as you control this as well. So you save your thing from a removal spell or from a combat or you win a combat. Maybe this eats something of your opponents too when it comes down if they're attacking you at that time. Uh, and then that permanent that you choose is indestructible for as long as Kyodai is in play. And that's really, really nice. Uh, and then you can pay one of each color mana to get plus five, plus five, which can happen. So it's really good. Blade of the Oni, one of the black, three, one menace. Uh, it's got reconfigure for two BB and turns a creature into a five, five menace. So just good value, good curve creature too. If, if uh, your main black, not looking to splash this one as much, but, but if we're main black, we'll, we'll happily play it. Springleaf Avenger, three green, green, six, five ninja with ninjutsu. Three and a green. When it deals combat damage to a player, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. So all the value here. Uh, it's hopefully going to pick up a creature with an enters the battlefield ability when it comes down uh, for ninjutsu, which is already value. It hits for a whopping six damage, which ends games fairly quickly. And, of course, um, getting things back from your graveyard is super nice. So I really love this card. It's great. If we're main green, it can be splashed as well, and it's certainly worth Splashing. Uh, Tamiyo Completed Sage. I haven't gotten the chance to play with this one yet, but it certainly looks really good. Two green, blue, and then either two life or another green or blue mana. So as little as four mana. If you pay four mana and two life, it's three loyalty. If you pay all five mana, it's five loyalty. Plus one, uh, freeze an artifact or creature. Minus X. Exile non a non-land permanent card with mana value X from your graveyard, and you get a copy of that. So that can be quite nice. And then uh, minus seven, create Tamiya's Notebook, a legendary colorless artifact token with spells you cast, cost two less to cast, and tap draw a card. So uh, typically with this, I think you're, you're trying to cast it for five mana, just tick up, tick up, um, and then maybe tip, tick up again, and then just make the Notebook, and, uh, you know, lots of value here, and, and, and if we need to, we can make uh, a copy of a creature in the, in the graveyard or something like that to give ourselves a life. So card's really good. Hitetsugu, I haven't played with this one yet either, but it looks very, very good. Three and a black, four, four. Single black, sack a creature, scry two is a nice little ability to have. And then, of course, the main ability here of two and a red, tap, exile, top card of your library. You may play that this turn when you when you exile, so you don't have to actually play it. Uh, it deals damage equal to the exile card's mana value to any target. So three and tap, you know, shoot something uh, unless you reveal a land. Uh, and then... It, uh, this is instant speed, by the way, and then you can uh, play that card as well. So it's card advantage, it's affecting the board. It's also a 4-mana four 4-4, four, four, so it battles. Um, so this card is totally, totally good. We want to play black anyways. Shouldn't be too hard to splash for the red activated ability. Okay, so those are all the bombs. Uh, if I've missed any, let me know in the comments, but those are the bombs that I'm interested in taking uh, with my first pick, uh, and hopefully throughout the draft as other drafters can't play them. And we want to play as many of those as we can. Best Sagas. Behold the Unspeakable. Most folks will probably know what this does. Three blue blue. Saga shrinks your opponent's creatures for a turn. Um, then it draws you two to four cards. And then it comes back as a big flyer. So this is a great one to rebuy. If you can uh, return it to your hand somehow, you get extra cards out of it. And uh, it's, it's just a huge amount of advantage. And and we will, we will work very hard to splash this card in our deck whenever we can. Really, really good bomb level card. Similarly, Besaju reaches Skyward, three and a green for the Saga. Uh, the draws two forests. Chapter two doesn't do anything, and then it comes back as a giant reach creature. Just huge value. This is like a four mana six six most of the time, and drawing two lands, uh, although it doesn't really help with splashing, is still huge. Uh, it's card advantage. It pulls lands out of your deck, so you're less likely to draw them later in the game, and uh, helps you hit your five and six drop plays, uh, which is all very, very meaningful. This is one of the best cards in the set. 
happy to first pick this one. Machiko's Reign of Truth, one in white. Saga, chapters one and two. Target creature gets plus one, plus one for each artifact and enchantment you control. Uh, and then it comes back with a creature with power and toughness equal to the number of artifacts and enchantments. So this is like frequently giving plus three or plus four to a creature, and that's just a huge problem for your opponent. Uh, this is great late in the game when you have a ton of stuff. It's also not bad early when you've only got a couple things. And, um, yeah, just a huge amount of value buying this back with from the graveyard or uh, returning it to hand and replaying it uh, is, is really nice value as well. So uh, bomb level card and a great reason to be white. Uh, usually we want to be black or green, but uh, if we have a couple of these, it's it's a really nice reason to end up being main white. Long Reach of Night, three and a black, chapter one and two. Each opponent sacks a creature unless they discard a card, and it comes back as a menace creature. This is one of my favorite ones to uh, to buy back with Geothermal Thermal Kami, returning it to hand, or uh, getting it back from the graveyard. Just triggering this multiple times, just really, the first trigger isn't too bad for your opponent, but the second, third, fourth uh, gets really gross, and uh, if they're empty-handed, they have to sacrifice a creature. So, card is very good. One of my favorite uh, Black Sagas. Tales of Master Seshiro, four and a green saga, uh, chapters one and two, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature or vehicle, gains vigilance, and then comes back as a five, five vigilance haste. Just a huge amount of stats for this mana cost, and the plus one, plus one counters and the vigilance that it provides early are very, very meaningful. So don't overlook this one. It's a common, but it's one of the best uh, green commons and uh, is, is a great card. Tribute to Hirobi. This one, I'm like, I can't decide whether I love this card or not, so I'm not putting it bomb level, but uh, I do think it's good. One of the Black Saga, chapter one and two, each opponent creates a 1-1 one, one black rat rogue, and then chapter three, it comes back as a 3-3 three, three flying haste. You gain control of all rats, and then you can sack creatures when it attacks to draw cards. So there's a lot, go a lot of nice things going on here. It is a little bit awkward if your opponent has a way to sacrifice the rats you give them for value, if they have a dockside chef or something like that. They can also block with the rats for a couple turns. Um, they can attack the rats into you to just suicide them, so you don't really end up getting those. So there, there's a little bit of awkwardness with this um, saga, but uh, I think generally speaking, it's quite high power, and I would uh, be happy to first pick it. Okay, so those are the sagas. So we're trying to get as many of those as we possibly can. That's our, our real bread and butter for a deck like this, and you can see that most of them are uncommon or rare, so um, obviously we have to... Uh, spend a lot of, of high picks on them and hope that other drafters can't cast, uh, can't like add them to their deck because they don't have enough mana sources and they're not in those colors and we'll see a couple of them in, in packs two or three. Um, so, you know, if we get a ton of those, we're, we're laughing. If we don't, uh, we're now starting to look towards the best value creatures. Uh, so these are just creatures that affect the board and provide either multiple bodies or maybe they draw you a card or some other way to provide additional value. And we're happy to play them multiple times if we can. We're happy to return them to our hand from our graveyard, stuff like that. Imperial Oath, uh, five and a white sorcery makes three two twos and you scry three. Just a ton of power and toughness on the board. Makes it really hard for your opponent to close out if they're an aggro deck and sometimes allows you to actually push the final damage uh, on your side because um, they may not have enough blockers to deal with all these 2-2s. Two and Scry 3 is huge. You're often putting a couple lands on the bottom and, and finding your next action spell. Um, these are in order, by the way. These ones now are in order by, by color um, and not by, like, priority in the draft. So I'll sort of discuss that. Uh, Spirited Companion, 1 and a white 1-1. One, one, comes into play, draw a card. And it's an enchantment, which is super meaningful. So this is something that we want to, you know, play multiple times if we can, if we can return it to hand, uh, or, you know, just having this as a 1-1 in play early can disable a lot of attacks for your opponent. There's a lot of creatures with one toughness that don't want to battle with this thing. Akiba Reckon Array, this is a saga, but I kind of look at it more as a value creature, uh, was essentially a one mana 2-2 two -two menace that drains them for two over the course of a couple turns. So this is a great one just to get on board early, uh, get your life total a little bit out of reach, have a 2-2 two -two in play. It can enable some ninjutsu. It's an enchantment. It kind of just does a lot of great things. So uh, card's a very high pick. Virus Beetle, another very high pick. One of the black 1-1 one, one artifact creature. When it comes into play, opponents discard a card. Um, another one where if we get to play this multiple times because of nin ninjutsu or because of getting it back from the graveyard, it can be very, very devastating. And your opponent will not want to trade their uh, one toughness creatures for this because that's really bad value for them. 
Twin Shot Sniper. This is a nice one to come in off the splash. Three and a red, two, three reach when it comes into play. Two damage to any target. Can also be channeled for one and a red to deal two damage to any target. Um, just a, yeah, just a solid splash card. And uh, again, a nice one to maybe channel early, return to our hand later with Season of Renewal and and uh, get do it all over again. So uh, it's a great one. High pick. Geothermal Kami. This is kind of my favorite green common, I think. Uh, three and a green, four, three. When it enters the battlefield, you may return an enchantment you control to its owner's hand if you do gain three life. So this is what we're using to reset our sagas, reset our spirited companions. Um, so anything that's an enchantment that, that adds value, it's really nice to pick this up. Uh, also, Twisted Embrace, which we're going to get to in a second, which is the uh, black aura that kills something when it comes into play. Really nice to reset with this. Life of Tashiro, really nice to reset with this. So... This just does so much, and the the three life is huge. The four power is really nice. Um, so this is this is a a big priority for for a deck like this. Katoze, Silent Spider, three blue black, four four. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you get to exile something from your opponent's graveyard, and then you can play that card uh, with using any color mana. So just a nice body, and you know takes the best value of your opponent's graveyard. So this is great to play later in the game. Pretty easy to splash if we're already black. Not too hard to make blue. Gloom Shrieker, this is uh, another excellent value creature. One black green, two one menace. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, we return target permanent from our graveyard to hand. Uh, unfortunately, if it dies, it gets exiled, which I always forget about, so look out for that. But uh, we can pick this up with Geothermal Kami to reuse it again. We can pick it up with Ninjutsu pretty easily since it has menace. It's likely to get through. Uh, use it again. So it's, it's not hard to cast this two, three times in a game and just absolutely bury your opponent. Um, so this is certainly a priority. Colossal Sky Turtle for green, green, blue for the 6 of 5. Flying Ward 2. It channels for 2 and a green to return a card from graveyard to hand or for one of the blue to bounce something. Um, so just a lot of utility here. And then it, it's not too hard to cast this on turn 7 or whatever. And it's really hard to deal with when it comes down. Um, so another big one. Circuit Mender. 3 mana for the colorless artifact creature. 2, 3 when it comes into play. Gain 2 life when it leaves the battlefield draw a card so leaves if we bounce it with ninjutsu we draw a card if it dies we draw a card um anything like that if we can even bounce it with uh, an effect that allows us to bounce one of our own creatures like a uh, uh, moon snare specialist or something like that this card is huge value buying it back from the graveyard is really good um, and this is a high pick because it's colorless we're always going to be able to play in our deck uh tawashi guide bot a little less of a priority but still really nice especially going into the long game uh, four mana for a 2-1 that puts a 1-1 counter on something when it comes in, and then uh, four and tap to draw a card, but it usually costs three or two or one, depending on how many modified creatures we have. Uh, that's instant speed as well, which is always nice, and uh, going to the long game, this can really take over. And because it's colorless, it's easy to just pick this early and know that we can always put it on our deck. So, um, so uh, uh, before we go to the next... So of these value creatures, the top priorities, I think, are... The black cards, the uh, Reckon Array, the Virus Beetle, uh, and the colorless cards um, that we just talked about, Gloom Shrieker, um, and then Spirited Companion. Those are sort of the best of them, and, but they're all really good, and I'm happy to take any of them early and uh, play as many of these as we can. Our plan A, again, was to play as many Sagas as possible. The next is to play as many of these value creatures as possible. Synergy cards. These are going to ask a little bit of us in the draft, not too much, but a little bit, so we don't want to necessarily take these over some of those best sagas because we will have to do a little bit of work to draft around these. Brilliant Restoration, three colorless, four white, seven total mana. Return all artifact and enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, this is a huge effect when it lands, and I've, I've lost in tremendous fashion if you've seen that video to this. Um, because we already want to play so many enchantments anyways, it's not too hard for this card to be really good. Um, but we can juice it up with things like the Modern Age that let us discard cards um, or, and just draft like a ton of of uh, Spirited Companions and, and cheaper enchantments that we're going to be able to get down and get into the graveyard and just get a ton of value out of this. So I'd be happy to take this early. Uh, it's very, very powerful when it, when it does land. We just have to make sure that we have enough artifacts and enchantments in the deck and that we have access to four white mana at some point in the game. Jin Jataxius, Progress Tyrant. 5 blue blue 5-5. Five, five. Whenever you cast an artifact, instant or sorcery, copy it. Whenever your opponent casts an artifact, instant or sorcery, counter it for the first time. Uh, their turn. So this needs a lot of artifacts to be excellent. 
So if we have those, it's really good. If we don't, it's not very good. If we take it early, we can try to prioritize them. Uh, if we see it late and we have a lot of artifacts, we can snap it up. So just be aware that it needs artifacts to be good. Dockside Chef, single black, one, two, enchantment creature, one and a black, sack an artifact or creature to draw a card. Was, again, like it's not too hard. We already want virus beetles and spirited companions and, and cheap little value things. So this is going to be pretty good most of the time, but obviously the more of those things we have or uh, cards that generate multiple creatures when they come uh, into play, the better. So, but this card is, is always good. Uh, and the fact that it's an enchantment too matters. Nashi, Moon Sage Assign. I haven't played with this yet, but it looks like it's quite good. Uh, one black, black, three, th three, two with ninjutsu, three and a black. When it deals combat damage to a player, you exile the top card of both of your libraries. Till end of turn, you may play one of those and you just get to pay life equal to the mana cost rather than pay mana. So it gives you a free spell unless you flip land for both of you, which is un unlucky, but can happen, of course. Um, but I mean, just a good rate, three, three mana, three, two. If this hits repeatedly, you get to keep doing it. Uh, and of course, the ninjutsu is nice. There's synergy there. And uh, if we have the enablers for this, it's uh, going to be really nice. Generous Visitor, single green 1-1. One, one. Whenever you cast an enchantment spell, put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature. We just need enough enchantments to make this good. And uh, oftentimes you will have those naturally, but sometimes you won't. So just be aware of that. Weaver of Harmony, similarly, this needs a lot of enchantments to be good. 1 and a green 2-2, two, two other enchantment creatures you control gain plus 1, plus 1. And single green tap, copy, target activated or triggered ability from an enchantment source that you control. And you may choose new targets. So this is really nice. So if you've got an enchantment that says come into play, exile something, you can exile two things, um, which is really good. Or if you have, um, you know, something like Machiko's Reign of Truth that's giving plus one, plus one to a creature of yours for each artifact enchantment, you get to do that for two creatures if you use this uh, activated ability. So this is really good if you've got a lot of enchantments, essentially, and a lot of enchantments that have abilities. So just, again, just be aware that this is... Um, it's not great on its own with only like five enchantments in the deck, but uh, if we've got like 10 or 11, which is pretty easy to do, it's going to be really good. Jukai Naturalist, same story here. Green, white for a 2-2 lifelink. Enchantments cost one less. Um, if we have a lot of enchantments, this is adding a lot of mana for us incidentally. If we don't have very many and we're not easily touching white then uh, and green, I'm assuming we're in green, but if we're not in green or white very easily, then this is not the card for us because we don't want to be splashing uh, a two-mana 2-2. Two -two. But if we're in green or white and have good access to the other color, this card's really good, and we'll obviously have enough enchantments. Naomi, Pillar of Order, three white-black, four-four. When it enters or attacks, if you control an artifact and an enchantment, create a 2-2 two -two white samurai with vigilance. So this one, we need to have most of the time enough artifacts to make it work. It's pretty easy to have enough enchantments, but we need to have enough things like virus beetle or network terminal or cards like that that are artifacts we actively want to play already to enable this thing. So just be aware of that. And obviously uh, this is much more splashable than the naturalist we were just looking at. Um, so if we're in black, pretty easy to get access to a white mana by turn five and this thing is very powerful if we do finally i think this is the last one spirit sisters call three white black enchantment i'll read this one at the beginning of your end step choose target permanent card in your graveyard you may sacrifice a permanent that shares a card type with the chosen card if you do return the chosen card from your graveyard to the battlefield and it gains if this permanent would leave the battlefield exile it instead of putting it anywhere else so what we want to be doing with this card is sacrificing our cheap value creatures like Virus Beetle, like Spirited Companion, to get back giant creatures or big sagas that have uh, traded off in combat uh, and getting those back. So we just need to make sure that we have enough value creatures. We want to make sure we can cast this reliably, and we want to make sure we've got good things to go back uh, to get back. So this does ask a little bit, but I think generally speaking is very powerful, especially in this style of deck that's, uh, that already wants these cheap value creatures and wants big splashy cards. Being able to get those back later, really, really good. All right, so those are the synergy cards. Now we're looking for good removal spells. Uh, so these are going to be removal spells that have some kind of uh, sort of lasting value or just really good rate and really effective. So touch the spirit realm, Luna White uh, to exile something. 
It's an enchantment. It can channel to flicker something. So sometimes what you'll do with this is flicker something and then get this back to hand with um, Season of Renewal or something like that, and then we get to play it all over again. Um, and sometimes we just need to exile something. So this is very important to, to have access to something like this, and this is one of the better ways to do that. Assassin's Inc., similarly, not a super huge priority, but um, two, two black black to uh, kill a creature or planeswalker costs one less. If you have an artifact, one less if you have an enchantment, so sometimes it costs three or two, two mana. Um, sometimes you just need to kill a thing, and this will let you do that. But the best one, in my opinion, is Twisted Embrace, which we're looking at now, 2BB, for an aura when it enters the battlefield. Uh, it kills a creature or a planeswalker, and it gives the creature its enchanting plus one, plus one, which is not nothing. That is a nice little bonus. And if we're afraid that our opponent's got an instant speed removal spell to kill our creature in response, which would blow us out when we're trying to do Twisted Embrace, we could put this on a vehicle that's not uh, currently crewed or some other artifact. Like, we could put this on a network terminal that's not a creature, right? Or a treasure token, if we have access to one of those for some reason. And that way we still get to kill the thing we want to kill. We're not worried about getting blown out by something like Assassin's Inc. Instant Speed Kill a Creature. Spinning Wheel Kick. This is a favorite of mine just for flavor and I think it's really fun to play. Uh, XX Green Green. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each of X target creatures or Planeswalkers. And so if you have a Death Touch creature, this is going to kill as, as many things you have mana for. So, uh, so it's four mana kill one thing, six mana kill two things, eight mana kill three things. I've killed four things with this with ten mana. Uh, notably, Life of Tashiro, when it's flipped, adds a mana to help cast this. Um, so we want to have Death Touch creatures if we can with this one. But green often provides us with four power creatures anyways, which are they tend to be big enough to kill most of the things we want to kill. So I really like this one. Okay, so hopefully we get, we're able to pick up a removal spell or two. They're not a huge priority. Um, but as soon as we're not seeing cards that we've talked about previously, good cards that we really want to play... We need to start taking lands as soon as we possibly can. Uncharted Haven is the best of them for this deck, for this strategy. Comes in tapped. You choose a color. It adds that color. So this is going to sort of be our catch-all for, for doing four and five color stuff. Take these quite highly. As soon as you're not seeing cards, you're, you're like, this this is an amazing card. I need, I need to put this in my deck. As soon as we start seeing medium commons and we're just like ah, i don't know this might be okay might not be take the land take the land every time you don't see something awesome uh next we're looking for the black and green producing dual lands since uh black and green are the best colors for this strategy and they have the most good cards um and notably i'm not including the red dual lands uh, because we're least likely to be playing red cards but obviously if you have a really good red card like Fable of the Mirror Breaker, take a red dual land as soon as you see one. Um, but if we don't have anything like that, we're sort of prioritizing these uh, black and green ones first that that touch uh, blue and white. Then we're happy to take the uh, red producing ones as well, um, or the Tranquil Cove, the blue white, especially if we're looking like we're going to be main blue or main white and we need to splash the other. Um, so, you know, these are all going to depend on how the deck is coming together and what uh, cards we have that we want to go with them. We've got colorless fixing as well. Network terminal, uh, three mana artifact that uh, taps for mana of any color. And then this is actually a decent little value engine later in the game. If we have another artifact, we can pay one, tap this, and another artifact to draw a card and discard a card. That can actually sort of generate a good, a good amount of value over the course of the game. So um, don't overlook this one. This is another one. As soon as we're not seeing really, really high impact, excellent cards in the pack, Snack, snap up a network terminal or an ecologist terrarium, two mana artifact when it comes down, search for a basic land, and uh, two tap sack to put a 1-1 one, one counter on a creature at sorcery speed. Terrarium's definitely not as good as terminal, but still another card that I'm happy to just pick up when there's nothing awesome in the pack. Um, so this is like, I'm talking like pick five, pick four maybe even, or like pick one. If the pack is really weak, just take the land. But this is going to be pretty early. I know we've talked about a lot of cards but in the scope of an actual draft, we're going to start taking these around pick five because we're not going to be seeing the sagas anymore. People are taking those highly. We're not going to be seeing bomb rares. We're not going to be seeing good removal. So take these highly. Green-based fixing. Commune with spirits. We need 
9, 10, 11 green source in the deck to really rely on this. But once we have that, it makes it really easy to find our other lands of other colors. And of course, pull, pull sagas into our hands. It's a very, very powerful card. So if we're heavy enough green, this does a lot of work. We can play two of these. We can play three and trim a land. Uh, this card's really good. I would take it early if I didn't see anything good in the pack. Grafted Growth. Similarly, I'm happy to speculate on this. This enables us to play the Invokes that we were talking about before. This enables us to play the Dragons that are double pipped. This enables us to play Behold the Unspeakable, which is double pipped. So uh, this is not like a great card, but being able to play an Invoke or a Behold or a Dragon uh, is all of a sudden makes it worthwhile to play this card. So um, again, speculate on it. If there's nothing good in the pack, just take it. Greater Tanuki. I'm blocking this one a little bit with my face. I'll move my uh, face out of the way. This is the... Oh, jeez. This is the uh, six mana, six five, trample. It's an enchantment creature. When it comes down... Uh, sorry, not when it comes down. It can channel for two and a green to find a basic land, put it onto the battlefield tap. So if we're sort of main green, we can use this to find our splash color. And later on, uh, it's just a big beater. So... It's uh, it's it's an excellent card. It's not as high of a priority as some of the cards we talked about before, but fixing is excellent. And if it's looking like we're going to be playing green, then we will be happy to take any of these three cards. Um, next is uh, the role players, and we'll talk about these key role players first. And these are cards that we want to have access to one of either Season of Renewal or Shigeki Jukai Visionary. Obviously, way easier to get Season, but if you don't, uh, or if you have Shigeki already, you don't need Season quite as badly. But we always want to have some way to return things from Graveyard to Hand. Season is obviously excellent because it can get back a creature and a Saga or Enchantment creature. So very easy to get two things back. And the things that we're getting back are often high uh, impact things or creatures like Virus Beetle that are, are generating value and are cheap. Um, Shigeki does a similar thing. It also comes down early as a 2-mana 1-3. Uh, I haven't really used the land ramp ability, but it is a nice way to get it back into your hand so you can channel it for uh, XX Green Green, just return a ton of cards to hand later in the game. This just totally takes over. Um, these two together also go infinite, so keep that in mind. And then Fang of Shigeki. If we're in green, we really want access to one or two of these. these it just really ties the room together. It comes down early, uh, makes your opponent's life miserable if they're trying to attack you. It can get in and enable ninjutsu. It counts as an enchantment. It turns on your green-based removal, like Spinning Wheel Kick, Master's Rebuke. Just does a ton of great stuff. So we really want one or two of these if we're in green. Um, so really want to be prioritizing those. Uh, okay. So... Back to uh, the just the general role players. So these are cards we're going to start to take below the lands and sort of as our deck needs. If we're starting to sort of see a lot of green cards, we're going to sort of start taking more green cards so that we have a solid amount of green. If we're seeing a ton more blue, maybe we start taking uh, more blue cards. But the, this deck is mostly going to be base green, base black, base white. So Modern Age is going to be a bit more of a splash, I would think, most of the time. Um, but yeah, we're going to start taking cards in this category based on our needs. So our curve, if we need two drops, we've got to prioritize two drops. If we need removal, we're going to have to take some removal. Um, that sort of stuff. Or if we're trying to build um, uh, some synergies and some value engines, which we'll talk about in a little bit, we'll be looking for them there. So Modern Age, uh, one in a blue saga, loots twice, and then it's a 2-3 flyer. Azusa's Many Journeys, one in a green saga, uh, play an additional land, gain three life, and it's a 3-3. Three, three. So these are just sort of bread and butter, more ways to just sort of get ahead, generate value, uh, and they're just solid, solid cards. Um, all of the channel lands are really good. These are the, uh, the cycled lands that have different... Uh, uh, channel abilities, they come into play untapped, so they can just replace one of your, um, you know, quote unquote, you know, you know, one of your basic lands or whatever. Um, and uh, and then sometimes you just get value from them. You can also return them to hand with uh, Shigeki. So if, you know, sometimes you've got that going on, uh, you can reuse these. So yeah, these are, uh, these are all excellent and are to totally fine uh, mid-level picks in my opinion. All of the shrines are decent, except for the blue one. Um, 
but we would pick up the blue one once we had one or two of the other shrines just to sort of pump up those other shrines. The white one is the best, um, probably followed by the green one, followed by the red one, followed by the black one, and then the blue one is really only useful to pump up the other shrines. But happy to speculate on these, and uh, they can do work in the style deck. And, it, and it, we're already set up to play a bunch of fixing, so it can be certainly possible to be playing like three of these and splashing the third or four and splashing a couple of them. So, uh, and when you get multiple of these in play, it's it's very powerful. Um, all right, we've got some medium-ish removal here. March of Wretched Sorrow, X and a black, uh, deals X damage to our creature player. You gain X life, instant speed. The life gain is really nice. It's splashable. If you need to kill something, you'll be happy to pick this up, but I wouldn't pick this early, I don't think. Fade into Antiquity, Tuna Green, Exile, Artifact, or Enchantment. This is not an instant. I've made that mistake a couple times uh, on video, so that's kind of bad. But uh, this kills a lot of things that you need to kill. Solid removal spell, Master's Rebuke, one and a green instant uh, for a bite spell. Your creature deals damage to their creature. Great with Death Touch. It's instant speed. If you got big things, you're going to be able to kill lots of stuff with this. Uh, again, don't need to stock up on removal in this format, but if we didn't see any of the good removal spells that we talked about earlier, we will want like two, three removal spells in the deck to make sure we have ways to kill things. Similarly, we could take Intercessor's Arrest, two and a white, uh, Aura, or Tamio's Completion, three and a blue Aura, which both essentially lock down whatever they're attached to. Uh, and these are easy to splash and they can actually be searched up with a card called shrine steward which we'll get to in a little bit so if we're really hurting for removal we can pick these up splash them and sometimes actually search them up for for additional value so again not cards that are priorities but if we need removal we're happy to play them and then there's kind of like the bad removal spell so march of otherworldly light x and a white Instant exile artifact creature enchantment with uh, mana value X or less. So if you need to exile a big thing, you're going to need a lot of mana. And that's the only thing that's that's awkward about this. Um, the additional cost is not really something we're, that's going to come up all that often uh, with something like this. So if we're desperate for removal, we'll take it. Um, seismic wave. We're just not really trying to play red. So if we have to splash this because we need removal, we will. Two and a red instant. Two damage to any target. One damage to each non-artifact creature target opponent control. So generally you get three damage. Two plus one on something and then maybe get to take out something else. And it can be really powerful, but uh, generally not looking to play it. Ninja's kunai. Single mana equipment. Equip one. Equip creature has one tap. Sack the kunai to deal three damage to any target. This can go to face, which is nice. Uh, it can be uh, a decent way to remove something if you really need a way to remove something. So um, you can play this if you need to, but hopefully you won't have to. Um, thirst for Knowledge. Uh, so the, And Roadside Reliquary. So these are just like raw card advantage spells, which are not as important as generating value on the board. Um, but these can be all right uh, if we don't have any... Ways to draw cards, Thirst for Knowledge 2 and a blue, instant draw 3, discard 2, unless you discard an artifact. The more artifacts we have, the better this gets. Um, but we don't want to load up on too many of these because we really do want to be impacting the board throughout the game. Roadside Reliquary is the colorless land with a 2-tap sack. Draw a card if you control an enchantment. Draw a card if you control an artifact. If you can trigger this reliably by having an artifact and enchantment to get two cards out of it, I think it's worth playing. I would not play it. Uh, unless I were playing 18 or more lands because it does not tap for a color and we're trying to do multicolor stuff. So oftentimes it doesn't make the deck, but uh, if we can trigger it reliably and we're like not too stretched mana base wise, we can rock it. Here's our white curve filler, uh, golden tail disciple, tuna white, two, three life link, real nice against aggro decks, counts for an enchantment, Nariki Amazaki, tuna white, three, two vigilance when it attacks alone. Or any samurai warrior attacks alone, cast enchantment from your graveyard. So good if we have a lot of enchantments. Not so good if we don't. Um, well, medium if we have a lot of enchantments. Uh, Skyblast Samurai, 7 mana, 4-4 four, four flying, costs 1 less for each enchantment. This is a card we'll take a little bit earlier if we, if we see that we're really starting to pile up enchantments. It's easy to splash. Uh, it's a really impactful body. And Sunblade Samurai, 4 and a white, 4-4 four, four vigilance, channels for 2 to search for planes and gain 2 life. So these are all... Uh, nice curve fillers. Uh, in the case of Skyblast Samurai, kind of like a nice payoff if we're doing a heavy enchantment thing. Then we've got the other white curve fillers here, Lion Sash, 
a two mana one one that can exile cards to get bigger and then reconfigure and, and pump a creature. I just found this to be a pretty clunky, but uh, it can it can do work um, if you need another card in your main white. Uh, Moth Rider Patrol, one mana, one, one flying. It's better with ninjutsu. It can pay three and a white and tap to tap to our creature, which is generally not that useful, but sometimes comes up. Um, yeah, the card just isn't that good because we're not trying to aggro people down. But, uh, again, if we need curve filler, if we've got ninjutsu, we'll play it. Selfless Samurai, two mana, two, two. Samurai, uh, whenever a Samurai attacks alone, it gains lifelink, and you can sacrifice this to give a creature indestructible until end of turn. So, a nice Curve out play, not that great in the late game, so we're only really looking to play this if we're base white. And then we've got uh, some white conditional removal. Fall of Lorconda kills something with Mana Valley 4 greater and then comes back as a 1-3 defender that uh, when it dies, draw a card. Card's just not that good. It's, it's just a little too conditional, but um, we'll play it if we need to. And if we have Dockside Chef, it's a little bit better because we can always sacrifice the 1-3 to get uh, an extra card off of it and off of the Dockside Chef, which is kind of nice. So um, you could splash this if you need to. Uh, it's just, it's it's fine. Similarly, Repel the Vial, three and a white, exile, a creature with power four or greater. So again, pretty, pretty conditional, uh, but it can also exile an enchantment of which there are many that we want to get rid of. So conditional white removal spells, you'll know when you need these because you won't have any removal and you'll be like, crap, I guess I got to take these. Uh, black Curve Filler, Grave Lighter, two and a black, two, two flying when it enters the battlefield. If something died, you draw a card. Otherwise, each player sacrifices. So if we have ways to turn this on, if we've got Oni Cult Anvil, if we've got uh, Dockside Chef, then this can be really good, but it's not a reliable um, way to draw extra cards um, because it's just hard to sort of set this up in combat. We need ways to sort of do it naturally. Anchorize Infiltrator. One and a black, one, two flyer. I really like this one. Comes down early. Later in the game, you can play, pay three and a black, plus two, plus two. Uh, it enables ninjutsu. It can end games on its own. Uh, it comes down on turn two. So if we're base black and we need uh, an early play, we can do this. We're not really looking to splash uh, any of these cards that are listed here. But uh, if we're main black, then we'll rock them. A Leech Gauntlet, two mana, two, two lifelink, reconfigure four. This card just not that impactful. Two mana, two, two lifelink just isn't that good in this format. And reconfigure is super expensive, but it does count for an artifact. It does cost two mana, and sometimes we just need a two drop, so we'll take it and play it then. Nizumi Blade Blesser, two and a black, three, two, uh, has death touch if you have an artifact, has in menace if you have an enchantment. So if you can do the artifact plus enchantment thing reliably, this can be okay. Uh, it can, tra it can tra um, enable ninjutsu, which is nice. So, you know, if you need a three drop, you can play it. It's fine. Uh, ninjutsu style fillers and role players. Moonsnare Specialist, probably the best of them. Three, three and a blue for a 2-2 that bounces something when it comes in. Ninjutsu for two and a blue. Mukatai Ambusher, three and a black, three-two lifelink. Ninjutsu for two mana. Uh, Nizumi Prowler, one and a black, three-one. Ninjutsu for two mana when it comes in. Target creature gets death touch and lifelink. Uh, so the Prowler is particularly nice because... Uh, it can uh, give one of your smaller creatures that got blocked death touch, and so it allows for that to trade, and then uh, you're left with this 3-1 uh, body. So that's some good value. And then Searchlight Companion is just a really nice way to enable ninjutsu. It provides two va uh, two bodies. It has flying, so it's hard, hard to block, obviously, and then you get to pick it up, you get to put it down again, get another 1-1. One, one. So that's just a nice little... A combination with some of these ninjutsu creatures. So you'll take ninjutsu creatures if we have a lot of ways to sort of benefit from it. Uh, Virus Beetle, Spirited Companion, cards like that. Uh, Circuit Mender especially. Cards that when they enter and leave the battlefield they have effects. And then um, yeah, and then of course uh, if we have good enablers for these and our deck is like not shaping up super well we might just need to sort of play a few of these just to sort of uh, make playables and, and have something to do. But these are, are decent. Uh, and I should mention the Prowler and the Ambusher are artifacts, which matters some of the time in black. Green Curve Filler, the enchantment style stuff here. Uh, Bamboo Grove Archer, one in green, 3-3 three, three, Defender Reach that can discard for five mana to kill a creature with flying. Bear of Memory, two in green, 3-2. Uh, you can pay six to put a 1-1 counter on an enchantment creature and give it trample. That ability does come up a fair... Not a fair amount, but like some of the time. 
Um, so this card's decent. I'm, I'm happy to play one of these. Harmonious Emergence, three and a green, that turns a land into a four five with Vigilance and Haste. This card is actually a lot better than it looks. It's just, that's a lot of stats. And uh, you can search this up with uh, Shrine Steward, which we're, again, going to get to in a little bit. Um, so, yeah, just a solid card if you need four drops. If you benefit from having more enchantments, you're happy to play this. Jukai Preserver, three and a green, three, three, puts a counter on something. I have yet to actually channel this, but you can do it. And uh, when you do, it'll be really good. Again, if, if you're happy to play more enchantments, if you need four drops, if you're base green, it's just a solid card, four mana, four, four. Um, and then we've got some green ramp creatures. Careful Cultivation, which almost never plays the aura, but sometimes you can. Uh, discard for one and a green to make a 1-1 one, one that taps for mana. And Orochi Merge Keeper, two mana, 1-1 one, one that taps for mana. The modified clause doesn't really matter. Um, we're interested in playing these if we're base green, if we have a lot of four drops and, five, and or five drops that we're interested in ramping towards. But generally, these are not as good as they look. So... Be aware of that, but but if you got a lot of fours that you want to get to early, these can be pretty good. Cultivation is a lot better than Merge Keeper, I will say that, because it, uh, it's instant speed, it puts an enchantment in the graveyard, which sometimes matters, and uh, has the late game uh, mode of like giving something plus one, plus three in reach, which certainly can get you out of a jam, and it's helped me out from time to time. Uh, and then finally, Jukai Trainee all by itself here, just a two mana two two that's good in combat. Uh, if you need an early play, and your base green, you can rock. Okay, so those are all the sort of filler and role player cards. Now let's talk about some value engines and packages that we're sort of trying to put together to really make this deck tick. So one of the best ones is Geothermal Kami plus Enter the Battlefield creatures that are enchantments, Sagas, and or Twisted Embrace. So we're already trying to play a bunch of these things like Gloom Shrieker, Spirit of Companion, Long Reach, Twisted Embrace. We already want these cards. Geothermal Kami is excellent with all of these. This is a game plan with this deck. This is one of the, the top game plans with this deck, aside from just playing bombs and sagas, is using Geothermal Kami to reset these cards that give you a ton of value. So uh, and there's uh, the list goes on, but these are some of the best ones to use with it. So happy to play two, three Geothermal Kamis and just a ton of stuff that it works well with. The life gain is super meaningful. Um, this is like... We said this this archetype is plan A, or this strategy rather is plan A. This value engine is plan A for this strategy. So uh, this is what really what we're trying to do with this deck. Outside of rares. Uh, Kami of Terrible Secrets we haven't talked about yet. Um, I wanted to save it for right here. Uh, this is a card that often wheels, comes back around the pack. Um, and it works really well with all of these cheap value artifacts. And enchantments so um not too hard to enable this one and um really does pay you off quite well typically it's more difficult to find artifacts as opposed to enchantments for common terrible secrets so just yeah do make sure you have enough of those uh virus beetle being really the key one and you want artifacts that cost uh, less than four so that when this comes down uh it draws the card right away and Shrine Steward, finally we're getting that 5-mana 3-2 artifact creature. When it enters the battlefield, search your library for an aura or shrine card. Reveal it, put it into your hand. So this is slow, but it is effective. And if you can get into the late game, you can grind out some value with this guy. Uh, obviously, picking up shrines, if you have a couple of good ones, uh, this is a good way to make sure you find them. But uh, it also works quite nicely with Intercessor's Arrest and Tamiyo's Completion. If you're lacking removal, it can help you find those cards and uh, accounts for an artifact and uh, affects the board. And then, uh, you know, it, it's slow. It's not the best. But if you need removal, this is a great little package. And then it does have a little bit of value with cards like Harmonious Emergence, which is an aura, but is really just a big 4-5 green creature. And of course, this also does find Twisted Embrace, which is uh, really the probably the best target for it. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a nice little package, uh, especially if you need to find those last couple pieces of removal. Uh, Season of Renewal plus Shigeki Jukai Visionary or Colossal Sky Turtle is sort of an infinite loop where you uh, return Shigeki or Sky Turtle plus something else to your hand and then use Shigeki or Sky Turtle to return Season of Renewal to your hand. Rinse, repeat. You can continue to uh, rebuy things from your graveyard. And this is actually a really, really effective 
uh, way to just win a long game. Your opponent will have a really hard time beating you over the course of a game if you can continuously rebuy your removal spells and uh, your big sagas and, and pretty much you know whatever they're able to deal with, you can get it right back. So this is actually a really, really effective game plan. And since we want Season of Renewal already... Uh, it's you know uh, all three of these cards we actively want, so it's it's not like we're working too hard to pick them up. But if we do get them, that's uh, that much better. And finally, Sukens and Smelter and Oni Cult Anvil lets you make uh, a three-one uh, red construct with haste every turn, um, without costing you anything but a, a single mana. So that's a nice little value engine. Less likely to see these cards in a multicolor value deck, but uh, if you do end up with a solid red contingent in the deck, this is one of the better things to be doing. Uh, Dockside Chef plus cheap value creatures. Searchlight Companion is a nice one because it makes an extra creature. Dockside Chef is quite good just in general, but obviously with these value creatures, it's that much better. It's pretty gross with Circuit Mender as well. You draw two cards when you, when you activate it. Um, and then Circuit Mender plus Ninjutsu creatures. Uh, and uh, Circuit Mender is kind of a stand-in for any good, uh, cheap value creature. It could be Virus Beetle, could be Spirited Companion, uh, you name it. But Circuit Mender is certainly the best of them since you get to draw a card when it leaves the battlefield. Um, and uh, yeah, really, if you have a couple of Circuit Menders, it actually you know makes us want to play something like Moon Circuit Hacker a little bit more. Where normally in this style of deck, it, it wouldn't be high enough of an impact card. Um, you know, in this situation, uh, I think it would work out quite well. Uh, and Circuit Mender is especially good because our opponents don't want to block it because they don't want to give us the card if, if it dies in combat, and then we get it anyways by uh, ninjing something in. Uh, and Sunblade Samurai plus a Plains it enables a White Splash with uh, really not no cost uh, because if you draw the Samurai, you just channel it for two colorless. It doesn't require any color. You get the planes, and now you can cast your Imperial Oaths. So Sunblade Samurai kind of counts as extra white sources in your deck, and then also is itself a solid creature uh, once we have the white source. Okay, so that's sort of the main notes. Um, and I, I did forget to mention Kami of Transience, I'm now realizing, which is uh, two mana, two, two. Uh, that gets plus one plus one whenever you cast an enchantment spell and you can bring it back from the dead. That's a really good one as well. That sort of fits into the synergy category. Also, Historian's Wisdom, Now I'm, I'm now recalling. Uh, it's the three mana aura. It gives plus two plus one, and then you get to draw a card if the creature has the greatest power on the battlefield. That's another just sort of green curve filler kind of card, but it's quite good with Geothermal Kami. Um, so if I didn't mention a card, it's either because I forgot about it, and please let me know in the comments, or it's because I don't uh, consider it really a, something that I'm actively trying to play in this strategy. Uh, so if I didn't mention a card, it's probably because I just don't ever want to put it in my deck. Uh, sometimes you have to, obviously. You'll sort of know when you need to do certain things like that. But uh, but uh, I tried to touch on every single notable card for the strategy. So let's talk a little bit about deck building. Um, we want to have one main color, ideally, with several splashes or two main colors. Uh, no more than two main colors. We don't want to be like an even split three color deck or, or anything like that. Uh, and generally speaking, we want those main colors to be green or black uh, or green and black and sometimes white, but hopefully green or black as they are ten they tend to be stronger, but white's totally fine too. It's got a good roster of sort of filler cards that can just get us to the late game. Um, we want to play 17 to 18 lands, no fewer. Oftentimes you want 18 because we're trying to play six drops. We're trying to, you know, splash. We're trying to add extra color sources in our, our mana base. And adding that 18th land uh, really helps to do that without stretching it too thin. Uh, we want to make sure we have six or more early game plays that affect the board. So we're talking creatures here. Um, so, again, all these things like Virus Beetle, Fang of Shigeki, Spirited Companion, uh, even something like Jukai Trainee if we're uh, in a pinch. One or two mana. Uh, creatures that can attack and block and um, or sagas that can you know generate some value and then become creatures so that we have some board presence early so that we don't lose the aggro decks and we can start to pressure the other decks that are trying to do late game stuff. Um, raw power, aka sagas in this format, which are sort of the most powerful cards, is better than overarching synergy. A deck full of great sagas that don't really care about each other quote-unquote, is way better, in my opinion, than like a deck, like a streamlined 
uh, ninja deck or artifact deck. I mean, maybe the very, very best, most streamlined uh, of those decks would be, you know, amazing, but those rarely, if ever, come together in the draft. So it, it's really just much better to focus on raw power and individual card quality than it is to sort of be like, I'm building the ninja deck, I'm building the artifact deck. Um, so uh, ideally, we just want raw power individual cards. Uh, and then finally, on board value is greater than card advantage. So what I mean by that is we want we want our cards to be doing something on board, as we're talking about just a couple of points ago. We want them to be creatures. We want them to be um, removal that's maybe like coming back, like Twisted Embrace with Geothermal Kami. Uh, we want sagas that are generating value, but they're on board. They're putting one one counters on our creatures. They're attacking and blocking. They're shrinking our opponent's creatures. Um, you know, th these kinds of things are really, really important, whereas pure card draw is not as important. It can be okay, but again, we need to be not dying to the aggro decks, and we need to be pressuring the other decks that are trying to do late game stuff. Otherwise, uh, if they do happen to have a better late game than us, um, then we're kind of just delaying the inevitable. So if we can apply some pressure, sort of gain traction by having all these sagas, uh, popping off and, and being able to affect the board early, sometimes um, we can just gain an insurmountable advantage over our opponents who are also trying to do this kind of late game stuff. Let's talk about how to splash. Splashing uh, meaning, you know, playing one or two cards of, a, of an off color and how do we make the mana base for that, right? So we want to splash only the best cards in our other colors. We don't want to be splashing you know, even something like a spirited companion, one on a white, one, one, draw a card when it comes into play. We don't want to splash that. We want that to be sort of one of our main colors when we're playing a card like that. It's not impactful enough um, because we're, we're, we're uh, assuming that we're going to be able to cast our splash cards on like turn five, six, seven, and later. So they need to be heavy hitters. We don't want sort of little tiny cards that don't do a whole lot. Um, they must be good in the late game, kind of the same thing that I just said there. And then uh, single pipped cards only, unless we have something like Grafted Growth, which gives, um, you know, two of, of any color, which is very important, as we talked about, for splashing the dragon, splashing uh, Behold the Unspeakable, splashing the Invokes. Uh, if, we, if we don't have that kind of a thing, we really don't want to be splashing cards with double pips. So something like Imperial Oath, the uh, five and a white makes three two twos. That's a perfect example of a great splash card. It's powerful in the late game. Uh, it comes down. Uh, it's easy to splash because it's only got the single pip. And uh, yeah, that's the kind of card that we want to be splashing in our deck. Okay, and in terms of the mana base, we always want nine or more sources of our main color. So for base green... We want to have nine forests or, you know, seven forests and two green producing dual lands or, you know, six and three or whatever. And the more you can get, the better, right? Nine is a minimum. Like some of my very best decks in this format have had, you know, 10, 11 sources of the main color. And because we have so many dual lands, we're also, you know, we got five of our five or six of our secondary and then one or two of another and then one of another. And it's like you can build these mana bases that are super effective with dual lands because they give you access to multiple colors of mana. Okay, so we want three sources at a minimum for one or two late game splash cards. So if we had two Imperial Oaths that we were just talking about, we'd want to have three white sources in the, in, in the deck. So that could mean, hopefully not, but it could mean three planes, hopefully not. Uh, it could mean one planes and two dual lands that produce white and also produce green, for example, for base green. Uh, or it could mean something like we've got a Plains, we've got a Greater Tanuki that can find the Plains. We're really heavy green, we've got a Commune with Spirits that can find the Plains. So that's kind of like three sources. Maybe uh, we've got one other thing, we've got a Network Terminal or something, uh, which taps for any color. So now it feels like, okay, we've got our three sources covered for white, we only need to put one Plains in uh, the mana base. And that's ideal. As the next point says here, minimal number of off-color basic lands. We don't want to be playing, if we're trying to splash a red card, let's say we're trying to splash Twin Shot Sniper, three and a red, two, three comes in, deals two. Let's say we're trying to splash that card. We don't want to play more than one mountain in our mana base, if that's our only red card, because the opening hands where we draw that mountain, we're very likely to have to mulligan, because it can't cast, you know, 
all the cards in our deck except for the one card that it's there to cast, right? So we don't want to have like three mountains in the mana maze just for a twin shot sniper. We want to have a mountain, maybe a dual land, maybe a network terminal or something that finds uh, an ecologist terrarium, something that can find that mountain. Uh, that's the way we want to do the splash um, because uh, as we said sort of right at the beginning of this video, we can really get hurt by our mana base. We can really get hurt by mulligans early on if we're not building our deck carefully. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have questions, please let me know in the comments. And uh, finally, as we've sort of been saying here, dual lands are sort of always the best way to get splash colors because um, they tap for multiple colors. So they give you that flexibility. They don't strain your mana base. And um, it's really just the best way to, uh, to make sure that you can cast your spells. Thank you so much for watching. That does it for today's video. It was a bit of a longer one. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, thanks, as always, for watching. Please click like and subscribe if you enjoy what I'm doing here. It does help the channel a lot. Leave a comment if you have any questions. You can check me out on Twitter. That's How to Draft MTG. Check me out on Twitch, streaming occasionally. Also, How to Draft MTG. And you can contact me directly if you'd like. How to Draft MTG at gmail.com. That's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much. Bye for now.